Thank you so much for the invitation and for the opportunity to address this audience for the first time. Um, yes, I just want to quickly um, one or two remarks regarding the last presentation. Um, but um, yes, as a skeptic, I'm not just only interested in critical thinking in religion and in theology, I'm also interested in critical thinking of religion and of theology as well. Um, number two, um, I'm not fascinated with this notion that um, uh, you can believe whatever you want to believe. I'm only interested in your action or what you do. Our beliefs influence our action. Our beliefs share our action. Yes, but I hope we'll have time to discuss that. So, now, uh, and that is uh, connected with my presentation today because I'm looking at um, um, robot votes. You know, these are, you can see the way the, the words, the expressions are very difficult. Uh, but woman, cat woman, and how religion and the scientific thinking in Africa. Yes, recently there have been reports of um, various paranormal claims in different parts of Africa. And um, these reports highlight cases where, which is supposedly crash landed in a church compound or in a public sphere. There have been also stories and claims that people turned into goats or birds. And uh, women gave, uh, gave birth to, to horses or frogs. So popular and scientific thinking in uh, popular scientific studies of Africa, they have always emphasized the notion that magical thinking, magical beliefs, that they are very important in the functioning of Africa, in the social order in Africa. So, curiously, scholars have observed the recent years of African magic, and they have argued that actually Christianity and Islam are modernizing forces. So, so and my question there now is, how can one really justify that Christianity is some modernizing forces when it comes to um, Africa? So I'm going to use certain cases to illustrate the fact that um, religion is religion is anything but a modernizing force. It's not dispelling um, the magical and the superstitious thinking. Instead, religion here understood as Christianity and Islam, uh, they are superstitious reinforcing mechanisms, superstitious reinforcing narratives, and I would like the speaker to really, really help me understand how the religions, how um, Christianity, these religions are actually forces that dispel superstition or magic. Now, as you can see, this is um, a, a sample of the church in the, in the part of Nigeria, and uh, because Christianity is taking over from what they call the local witch hunters and they are now advertising and are using Christian narratives and using the Christian platforms to perpetrate and perpetrate witch hunting. Now, so in the first case is the case of a, a robot boat. I'm always, um, I'm always struggling to know how to uh, communicate this or explain it to people uh, because we know that boats can steal and all that. So, this, the picture I got is actually exactly the same picture that appeared in the press. That was in 2009. So, um, um, police officers paraded this goat because they, they, they believe, the story was that there were vigilante groups in the night. There are some local security outfits. They go around to maintain security in the community. So, they saw somebody who wanted to steal the car and they pursued the person. That, but they claimed that the person now turned into a goat, and they took the goat and took, and took the goat to the police station. So, and what happens is that when you are, when people are arrest, have made your arrest, police will parade the suspects before journalists. So that was how the, the, the poor goat now made it to the press. So, now, but locally, it's a serious issue. Why? Because there's this belief that human beings can turn into animals. Human beings can turn into cars or birds. Human beings can turn into insects. So, so they are missing that very distinction between animal. When you see an animal in certain places, you get suspicious. Who knows? 
Somebody must be up for something here. So, so that was what happened. And, the, 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 and also arresting the good suspect here now is a security measure because the belief is that when people are in danger and they have these supernatural powers, they could turn into goats to avoid arrest or avoid the danger. When the danger disappears, then they will not turn to human beings. So they have to keep it to wait to see whether the goat will eventually turn to human beings. And it never happened. We never got any knowledge of what happened. Now, <coughs> then, then, this, this, uh, this, um, sorry, this slide illustrates one particular belief about about this um, about the good uh, suspect. What is it? People believe that there are certain things you can use, certain local medicine you can use to neutralize bullets. Yes. So what they what they do is that they prepare this medicine not only for armed robbers, they also prepare it for police officers and security officers. So this poor guy from Ghana, so prepared his own anti-bullet charm and he wanted to test it. <laughs> Two things you don't do. That's what I was wondering. The speaker was talking about testing and religion, testing and religion. And my mind was doing like this. Testing and religion, do they go together? <laughs> so you can see what will happen when you test things informed by religion. So he did it and eventually he got seriously wounded um, in testing the anti bullet charm. So this is the belief that drives that particular notion. Now, but it is not only belief that people could also um, um, turn to goats or animals. There's also this notion that birds could also turn to human beings. So it goes the other way around. So that what happens there, and the, the, the belief is that um, when people have these magical powers and they're exercising those magical powers to fail, and that's what happened in this case. This woman was almost lynched at a, a bus stop in Lagos because the, somebody saw a, a, a bird fly across and according to him, there was a woman lying somewhere wounded and he claimed that this woman was a bird. So, so the belief here is that when the magical powers fail, dogs, goats, birds could turn back to human beings. So that was it. So, and that was what happened to this woman, and, uh, but she was eventually rescued and taken to the, uh, to the police station. Now, there was also another case where, in the course of the operation, people could, like as in this case, you know, when they, when they run out of their magical powers, they could crash. Yes. So, this story was in the news because this man, confessed that he was flying over the church but something happened probably to the magical Uguma or something. So he now, he now landed within the church premises. So and this was so much in the news and it was it was reported as a naked witch crash landing in, in the church premises. Now another Another form of belief is also the belief of uh, the disappearance of um, pennies, many pennies. Yeah, but private uh, people's private uh, organs. So there is this notion that people could touch you with their powers and your organs will disappear. That's the report. So uh, that is uh, two or three weeks ago. It was also reported in the, the media that within um, that uh, at a bus stop in, um, uh, in Lagos, that somebody gave a beggar some money and, uh, and when the person moved, the person felt that the manhood was no longer there. So, so that's the feeling. So the person felt that way and uh, people gathered and, uh, and they, they almost beat up the, the beggar. So the belief there is that people could take away the manhood and it's always the manhood that is in the press. And I, I was asking, because they are, they are, have, I've never seen any case where anybody said, yeah, it is the womanhood that disappeared or the womanhood that, um, that somebody took away. So it is always the, the case of the manhood. So these, these, are, these are claims that sometimes are informed, um, are informed by local magical beliefs. Now, but my argument here is this, that 
These beliefs, we are finding it difficult to address them because of Christianity and Islam. And because of the teachings of Christianity and Islam, and because of the way Christianity and Islam are being practiced in the region. And one of the ways Christianity and Islam are frustrating our ability to fight superstition is that Christian and Islamic experts are appropriating local medicinal roads, like the production of charms. Now, we saw the, the, uh, the seriously wounded local medicine man. Now, we have also people that call the marabouts. So what they do is that they, they use the uh, verses of the Quran and uh, they prepare this um, the charm and give it to you. And people don't question these charms because when you question it, you might get yourself into the slippery slope of questioning Islam, questioning Allah, and uh, being accused of blasphemy. So this is how, in this case, Islam is frustrating our ability to question this because you could be interpreted as challenging Islam and or insulting Islam or questioning uh, the teachings of Allah. <coughs> now, this is a more interesting case. And uh, not too long ago, this is a Christian pastor in Southern Africa. He walked on air. And, uh, and we'll see. Let's see how he did it. Coming down, there's a staircase in the in his house, and of course we could see him walking, and that's fine. And interestingly, we something is going to happen now. Um, eventually, we can't see his head, we can't see his hand, and um, and uh, you see. You can see. <laughs> Pastor Shepard Boucher from Malawi, but very influential. And one of the miracles he used to promote himself is this rubbish. Child's <laughs> kindergarten kind of uh, illustration. And when he was interviewed, he said, Look, that walking on air was one of the easiest things he could do. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah, so, so, so what happens is that. I know I was like tickled, I was fascinated by the last speaker when he brought Jesus walking on the, on the water. Yes. Now, narratives of Jesus, what Jesus did, the miracles did, that is why I was interested. You know, the last speaker said, okay, that miracles are possible. I wanted it, I, I, I had wanted him to do one, one, or tell us one, what happened? So, but there were, I never had that. He just said it and I was curious. So now these are stories that local pastors are now using, or these are where they, they are trying to replay some of these narratives. And when you question it, it's like, are you questioning Jesus? Are you questioning Christianity? And when you challenge Jesus, you say, are you a Christian? Which religion are you? So it is Christian narratives um, and Islamic narratives are frustrating, hampering, making it difficult for us to challenge these claims. Because at the end of the day, people get offended. And there is this notion of offense, which I said here, and so what was said, when you know, the last week I noted that, ah, we are not, they are not interested in whatever you believe. I'm interested. I'm interested in what, when you believe that somebody could walk on air, I'm interested. Yes, when you believe that somebody could walk on water, I'm interested. When you say that somebody could watch a serpent, the serpent will not be the person, I'm interested. I'm not just going to allow it to go. Sorry, I'm going to say This is exactly connected with what we had. I was at England yesterday. I was in Geneva. Uh, yeah, till yesterday. I was in Geneva addressing the human rights people. And they say, oh, we're not interested in belief, we're interested in action. I said, what informs action? You know, why are we not interested in beliefs and claims? Why? Why are we running away from that? I am really curious and I'm hearing the same thing here again. That's why I got a bit emotional. <laughs> what is going on? Because they were telling us child sacrifice 
Christ in Africa, they, they brought our you know, they cut off the two hands, they amputated the two hands. And somebody is telling me, seeing this, you are not interested in the belief that they formed it. Something is wrong somewhere. We need to find out that. I am interested. If I'm not interested in anywhere here at the Safety Congress, I'm interested. Oh, yeah, that would be a true 
a human being. Why? Because it's in the local discourse. Uh -huh. When you go to the when you go to the churches and the mosques, they also tell you stories similar, like like the revelation of the Quran. I mean, how can you tell us today that the, 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 the book was revealed to an ignorant person in a cave by the spirit? Come on, come on, and you tell us not to question it. I mean, they're just holding us hostage. Where is our friend that spoke all the time? <laughs> Okay, next question, Conrad. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> Let me ask you, uh, question, stand up. Yeah. Ah, okay, sorry. Thanks. Uh, all right, a uh, couple of points which fit in with what we're talking about. Uh, we haven't really talked much about uh, magic or superstition apart from your talk. And the interesting thing is that people tend to think that uh, superstitions are very, very old. Right? So for example, black cats being alive and so on. Actually, when you uh, do the folklore studies, it turns out they're not very old in general. They're only about 150 years old on average. Right? They tend to appear and disappear. Except when they become part and parcel of our religious traditions. Right? When they do that, then they get to hang around for many hundreds of years, which fits right into what you've been saying. Right? But there's a problem, which is that with those that are not part and parcel of religious traditions that appear and disappear, the thing is that when particular superstitions disappear, it's not that you are left with a situation when th there are no superstitions. They get replaced by others. Which is a kind of sad thing to say, because it means you do the fight, you finally manage to convince people that it's not true, and then what happens is that something else comes around the corner and they start believing else, something else, another superstition. That's yeah, but I want to add here that when it comes to my region, at least the way I understand it, local superstition, what happens is that Islam and the Christianity, they came with a lot of force. Yes, violence, education, scholarship, hospital, schools. So what you do is that every people now put their traditional superstition on the just did it, and accepted the superstitions of Islam and Christianity. That's my standard. Okay? So now, when apparently the, the colonial era left, I think, so, or in the rural, rural communities, so you now pick and choose depending on what you want, and depending on who you are, depending on your interests. So I'm, I'm having this feeling that actually do they really disappear, or they recede, you know, there exists a survival of the features. Like, like now, a lot of people will tell you that Malans, Marabouts, when they give you anti superstition charms, that it work. But go and look at it. It is the traditional superstition with a Quranic form. They just cover it with a couple of verses of the Quran. Okay? So, what happens there is that I think that people try to adapt in the, in, when they are when faced with situations. And then, at the end of the day, I think that what we are doing is that we are still recycling much of those traditional medicinal notions. But sometimes we frame them using Christianity and Islam. Yeah. <coughs> All right, first, thanks. <laughs> it was fun. Um, I want to point out that I was actually misquoted uh, by the last speaker. I, I did not say that I don't care what people believe. I said I don't care what people say they believe. And I think that is very important to your presentation right now, especially the men walking on air. Because I cannot believe for one millisecond, one picosecond, that that man actually believes that he walked on air. He felt the wires. He knew perfectly well that he is a grifter. Okay. He, he is a thief. Okay. And so I, I'm, my question has to do with um, how do you think, or do you have any suggestions as to how we can, um, in our attempt to not just swap out one set of superstitions for another, or try to avoid the, um, the inculcation of superstition into religion so that it continues on and on beyond a natural lifespan. Um, but do you have any suggestions on how we might address the simple, quite verifiable fact, I would argue, uh, that religions often are promulgated by people who uh, are best described as thieves? Uh, or grifters, or commoners. Um, again, I, I absolutely accept I care what people believe. I just don't care what people say they believe. 
I'm, I want to look at their actions. And when a man is dangling from wires and pretending it's a miracle, I don't have any problem disbelieving him. Um, how do we get, uh, I mean, disbelieving that he believes, right? How do we get general populations to disbelieve the grifters and the thieves? Because that, I think, is the key to this whole conversation. How do we do this? First of all, questioning religion has consequences in the world today. Yes. Yes. And let, let's just say it as it is. Not just religion, Islam. Yeah. Where's your Christianity? Yeah. Depending on where you are. I don't know the situation here in Poland. I'm sure you will tell me. Yeah. At the situation here. The states also. Yes. So, <laughs> so Western religion has consequences, and sometimes people shy, people don't want to get into that. And that is the reason why, even at the UN, they are not interested sometimes in questioning African traditional beliefs. But they want to highlight consequences of such actions or and all that as human rights abuses. Okay? So let us go out. For me, if you ask me, let's fulfill our mission as skeptical organizations. Apply reason, science in all areas of human endeavor. Period. For it is there. Let's accomplish that mission. Endeavor means religious endeavor. I want to say religious endeavor would mean Islam, Christianity, traditional religion, uh, Hinduism, and whatever. So let's fulfill a mission we have set, set up for ourselves. Let us not shrink from it because of the consequences involved. Because those consequences, they have more harmful. They are, they are doing a lot of harm in many, 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 in a lot of places. So it's not going to come easy. It's not going to come easy. It's a lot of, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of challenge, but what I'm saying is that let's go out and fulfill the skeptical mission we have already outlined for ourselves here. How long is confirmation bias? I give you evidence, and I say, oh, that shows that you're a, a liar because I know my pastor. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's tricky. Hello, um, I wondered if you could give us an update on your old friend Helen Pavio of Liberty Gospel Ministries and let us know what she's been doing lately. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, please, please explain to those who don't know the. The story. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Well, well, Helen, Helen owns a church called the Liberty Gospel Church, and she claims to be an ex-witch. Yes, that she was initiated and uh, she got delivered and became born again, and she now set out to exercise. She now goes around trying to identify and exercise witchcraft. And she uh, produced films and videos that at the end of the day we are linked to rampant abuses of children in the name of witchcraft in the region. So what I did, I said, look, if we are really going to address this problem, let's take our public enlightenment campaigns, challenging these claims she's making, linking unemployment, difficulties with witchcraft. We took the conference to her, the, the headquarters, and she mobilized her church members to the venue. And you know, skeptics are always very few, as you can see. You can, you can see, yeah, very few. So her church, her church members, around 200 of them, invaded the venue, took over the place, and beat me up and all that. So, and I have made a point of my of duty to keep monitoring her activities. So um, she now announced that she was going to do this, um, 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 this program in Lagos. And she also has a board program in Cameroon, in Cameroon. So she still goes on going about getting people to identify and connect their difficulties with witchcraft. And that is literally inciting people to go home, suspect, and um, undermine the rights of their family members. So that is, that's, that's the letter to her. She's still on it, on the business of witch hunting. And there is a strong connection, not traditional now, it is a church. That is at the forefront of it. And that's why I said the church institutions or the Islamic institutions are frustrating, they are hampering them, making it difficult for us to challenge some of these pseudo scientific claims, they are making it difficult for us to achieve a skeptical and a scientific Africa. Bill. 
uh, you started a panel discussion because two of our former <laughs> speakers were already asked, and Pat, who is the third one, would like yes, to Yes, I, I just want to, to make a small remark. Uh, you very rightly said the religion has to be uh, an object of uh, critical inquiry, and uh, especially when hearing about uh, those outrageous things that you uh, that you witnessed in, in Africa, I have to say it should be first and foremost Christian that would point the finger and say this bullshit doesn't have uh, doesn't have anything to do with my religion. Uh, the critic should come from the uh, because. As a Christian, when I will be pointing out that this doesn't really belong to my religion, uh, I, won't be, uh, I, I won't be in the danger of being accused of speaking against Christianity as, as, as such. And I think it is a great uh, responsibility that uh, critical thinking Christians have is to point out that those things are just wrong. The people who do this are deceivers and that it doesn't have to do anything with Christianity. Okay, quick response. Exodus 22 18 says, Suffer not a witch to me. Bible is promoted as the word of God. You know the challenge I have with priests and theologians? You know, when they are speaking, they make you to understand, oh yeah. This is not what this religion is saying. But when they are preaching, okay, they present this thing. Yes. Yeah. And of course, I'm an ex I'm an ex catholic and I guess maybe you understand it. I did a little bit. Three months theology, philosophy, I did for four, four years and all that. So I did my high school in the seminar. So, so I spent 12 years there. What they tell us in the seminary and what we say to the people in the community, they're entirely different. And you know, you keep struggling with these sections of your brain. Sometimes you can't reconcile it. I can connect with him. Many of our priests, when they are speaking, super. But when you go to the communities, oh yeah, you know, they lay it, they lay people. You just tell them those literal things. This is the challenge. And it is an eternal problem which you guys have to resolve. So when you come and you, they train the priests, they have a lot of knowledge. They go to universities. Many of my colleagues are studying here with doctorate. <laughs> the doctorate. So, so they, they have a lot of knowledge, but they go home and be talking to people who didn't finish high school. How do you say it? This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Period. <laughs> now, when I ask you, say, oh, yeah, it's a metaphor. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Can, how do you explain metaphor to those people in the village? You can explain it to me. And I'll try and listen to you like I have struggled to listen to you. But how do you explain this thing to people in the village? They have a different understanding. So we you in the church, we need to reconcile this. And we know whether what is actually the Christianity. Is it the Christianity as you presented it or the Christianity as it plays out in the rural communities? We have people who are practicing this religion do not even have up to a quarter of the kind of educational knowledge you have. Okay. You get uh, an aspect of the uh,